I'm here in Chisinau. I'm actually not even sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's something like that. The capital city of Moldova. The main reason, I guess, why I came to Moldova is because it is the very last country other than Andorra. Okay, Andorra is an exception, but I'm, I'm okay with not going to Andorra, honestly. Like, I don't think Andorra is a place that I really would get much out of going to. It's kind of out of the way. So I'm, I'm okay with Andorra being the, the, the one country that I don't go to in Europe. Other than Andorra, this is the very last country on the European mainland that I've never been to. And now I'm here. So it's kind of just putting a check on that item on the checklist. But Kishinau is interesting. This is a um, magazine universal. I guess uh, universal st magazine means store in Russian. I believe it comes from French. So I guess unique is a universal store. I guess it's probably like what you'd call it a department store in English. Like, you know, a huge store that has different departments that sell in aggregate most things that people would buy on a regular basis or even a not so regular basis. So, this is one of the least visited countries. In fact, it might be, it might be the most, it, may, it might be the least visited country in Europe. Uh, and I kind of see why. I mean, there's, there's really not much here to draw tourists. As far as tourist attractions go, as far as reasons why people who don't live here or have any family connections here or anything like that, as far as reasons for those people to come here, there are not many. I think that's clear. Uh, it's, it's not a tourist place. Not a place where a lot of foreigners would come for any reason. You know, it's not necessarily a... Not necessarily a bad place. Uh, it's, it's not... I mean, it does feel a little bit trashy, but not necessarily more so than other places that I've been. Actually, the overall vibe here is very much, in, in my opinion, this is just my subjective opinion, to my perception... The overall feel here is very much like Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, uh, which for me is not a good thing. I did not like Tbilisi. I don't really like it. Well, I wouldn't say that I dislike it here. That's not necessarily what I'm saying, but it, it does feel kind of trashy. It feels like, you know, it's not much here. I mean, you get, you get, a, few, get a few streets full of traffic. You get a few kind of trashy markets with people selling stuff on the street. And I'm sorry if trashy. I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm very being very condescending. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to sound arrogant or condescending. It's just you know, there's really not not much here that uh, draws the attention. I'm gonna go. So on this street here, what street is this? I can't even read the street name because it's covered by electrical wiring. Looks like Tigana something. I don't know. I'm gonna take it right here. Because down this street, there are a bunch of markets, and you can kind of get an idea of. Uh, boy, I feel like these are the kinds of places where bald and bankrupt always feels a little bit worried about waving his camera around because he's worried about somebody stealing it. I, sh I share his fear. I'm actually, I actually feel a little bit, just a little bit worried somebody's going to grab my camera out of my hand and run off with it here. So I'm going to try to. Be careful. I mean, it's probably not going to happen. I mean, everybody has smartphones now. It's not like it's not unusual for people people to be walking around with smartphones. But I just feel a little, a little uncomfortable here. But we'll see how it goes. If this video makes it to the internet, then you'll know that uh, my phone did not get stolen. So, Moldova. If you're not familiar with it, it's kind of like Romania. It has its own Moldovan language, which is basically a dialect of Romanian. I know some people will argue and say, no, it's a separate language on its own, but it's, it's basically Romanian with some, I guess, some minor differences, as far as I can tell. I speak like I know what I'm talking about. I mean, I don't know, I don't know either language, so it's hard for me to really gauge how different they are, but I get the impression that they're not that different. They're basically, if they're not two dialects of the same language, then at least they're two very similar languages. I hope that's fair to say. Lombard. I think Lombard is a pawn shop in Russian. 
And yeah, Russian has a very strong presence here because Moldova, even though its language is basically, I mean, culturally, it's kind of like a mini Romania. It has strong influence from Russia. And one notices that uh, Russian language signs exists in some places here. It's not, uh, even though Russian is not a national language here, it is a de facto used language that many people know. At least, you know, e even if it's not people's native language, it's a language that people can, can use competently, some, at least conversationally. And, um, yeah. It has some uh, some currency here. So, Chisinau as such is um, it's kind of like a Romanian city with a little bit more, just a, a tiny smidgen of Russian flavor in it, but not really that much. It's basically like it feels kind of like another Romanian city. Well, like I said, it feels kind of like. Tbilisi. Oh boy, people are selling seeds for plants, for vegetables and things like that. It's cool. Uh, this here is basically the... Um, you might call it a bus station, but they're not really buses. I mean, yeah, I guess you can call them buses. They're really what... Um, they're what Russian people would call marshutkas, which is basically... Um, a word for a privately operated kind of it's kind of like a cross between a bus and a taxi but it's usually some it's usually just something that some guy has like some guy just has a, a van like this and is using it to make a business out of transporting people between cities so I got here on one of these marshotkas just a few minutes ago and I'll be staying here in Chisinau for the day, for the night. I have a hotel booked here, where I intend to sleep tonight. But... <laughs> never try, never know. Isn't that the truth? Basically that meme about uh, the more you F around, the more you find out. Um, <clears throat> yes, this is the Gara Auto. Gara is uh, like a station. Basically, it comes from the French word gare. And a gare in French is usually a train station, but a gare auto is basically a bus station. So yeah, this is the gare auto. This is the bus station. We can take buses, marshal cars to all kinds of crazy places. And like I said, Chisinau in itself is probably not going to be that impressive. In fact, I think there's probably not much more to show than what I've already shown you folks of it. But, I have the intention, tomorrow, of coming here again and seeing if I can take Marshotka to Tiraspol. Now, Tiraspol is the main city in the unrecognized independent breakaway republic of Transnistria. And Transnistria is an interesting place, or at least it seems, I've never been there. I'm hoping to go there tomorrow. I've never been there, but it seems like an interesting place because it is basically a Russian exclave. Officially, it's part of this country, Moldova. De facto, in practice, it is an independently administered country where Russian is the most spoken language. And in fact, they even have their local currency, which is called the ruble. It's not the Russian ruble, I don't think. I don't think you can use Russian rubles there. I actually still have, um, in my pocket, I still have a few Russian rubles left over from my last trip to Russia. I'm gonna see if I can spend them there. But officially their local currency is not the Russian ruble. It's their, they have their own Transnistrian ruble. So I'll see how my, I'll see how far I can get with my Russian rubles tomorrow, if I end up going there. Yeah, if I end up going there. So, somebody did tell me, I don't think they're going to let you in. I don't think they'll let you in over the border as a tourist. Because Transnistria is a very sensitive area now, because it happens to be jammed between this country, 
Moldova and Ukraine. And as a quasi-Russian exclave that's literally right up against the border with, you know, against a western border of Ukraine, uh, you can imagine it's a sensitive area now. Um, my understanding is that people can get in. I am not aware of any restrictions on entry. Um, there is a military base there, a Russian military base that has been the subject of some attention. I think it was even the target of some missile attacks in recent days for reasons which are hopefully apparent considering the current situation in Ukraine. Um, but I'm not aware of any restrictions on entry. You don't need a visa as far as I know. You can just walk in, well, walk in, drive in. So I'm going to try it, see what happens. I mean, worst thing can ha the worst thing that can happen is they turn me away and say, no, you can't come in, in which case, okay, I tried. And if it works out, then it works out. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I came here from, uh, from Yash, or Yashi, which is a city in Romania, on a marshal as I said. The border crossing is kind of funny. Um, so first, whenever you cross a land border, you typically go through two border crossings. So first I checked out of Romania, and the Romanian border guard, he was a funny guy, he looked at my ID, and the only question he asked me was, do you have any guns? And I literally burst out laughing, which is not something... Normally you should... You probably shouldn't start laughing at the guy during a border crossing. Probably not the best thing to do. Um, but his question was just so unexpected that I, I, I literally just, just, just burst out laughing. And I think, I think that was the, the intent. I think he meant for me to laugh. I think he was joking around a bit. And I said, uh, no. And that was all. And then he, uh, you know, gave, gave my ID back and that was it. Um, but yeah, that was the Romanian guy. That was the Romanian customs guy when I was leaving Romania. And then coming into here, coming into Moldova, uh, there was a woman who checked my ID, but she didn't say anything. She literally didn't say a word to me. She just looked at my ID and gave it back to me. So that was that. So yeah, border crossing went out, went went okay without any issues. The rest of the trip here was okay without any issues. The Marshutka trip here from Yashi was only 15 euro. Uh, the driver accepted payment in euro cash, which was nice because I didn't have any of the local Romanian currency on me or Moldovan currency or any other kind of currency except euros. So that was nice of him to accept your payment in euro cash. And here I am. Um, I do not think that I'm... If I, I'm going to walk around a bit here in the city center, see if I see anything interesting. If I see anything interesting, I will film it, of course, but, I mean, you've already kind of seen most of what, what there is to see here. People selling flowers and food and, you know, the various sort of things that you typically see in markets like this. Uh, it's nothing really... I don't know if you heard, that woman sitting down was speaking Russian. So, yeah, um, Russian, even here, this is not even in Transnistria, this is in... This is still in Kishi now, but even here, Russian has a lot of currency. You hear a lot of people speaking Russian here. I don't know if they are people from Russia, or with Russian roots, whether they are Ukrainians who speak Russian, or whether they are Moldovans who speak Russian. I guess all three are possible. But anyway, so yeah. Greetings from a series of street markets in Kishinau. I'll go and stop filming for now. Like I said, if I see anything interesting, of course, I will make an effort to film it. Otherwise, the next video might be tomorrow of my efforts to get into Tiraspol from here. Tiraspol is not far. It is uh, only about 60 kilometers away. That's about a one hour drive or possibly even less. But let's say it, let's say it's about a one, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's say it's about a one hour drive roughly. So distance wise, it is not far. It is not necessarily difficult to drive there in terms of how far it is. But there is a border crossing and the border crossing is allegedly difficult. I don't know. I mean, I read online that it's fine. I read online that there's no problem, but somebody told me, uh, you know, just because of the current situation, uh, they may be worried of letting tourists in. So, I mean, who wants to go there as a tourist, seriously? Well, I do. So I'm going to try it. Anyway, I'm going to stop now and we'll see where my journey takes me. 
here you get maybe an idea of what I'm talking about. So this is a sign indicating a bookstore. If you go in there, uh, it's kind of hard to... <laughs> it's not really apparent from the entrance there, but this yellow sign indicates that there is, in fact, a bookstore if you go down the stairs there. And it's, it says there, you know, different types of... Uh, on the top it says in Romanian, or I guess Moldovan, there's a big assortment. Uh, and then here in Russian it says the same thing. Bolshoi Vibor, a large selection. Um, and I went inside there, and the vast majority, like, like the vast, vast majority of the books there were in Russian. And I'm going to wait until this... Uh... The ambulance was very loud. I wanted to wait till it passed by. So... This is something that I've seen in uh, a lot of these small sort of Eastern European countries that used to be very Russian influenced or still are to some extent. Uh, it was kind of the same thing. I mentioned Georgia. It was like that in Georgia. It was like that in Armenia. It was like that in Estonia and those, you know, Baltic states. Um, Russian is not a much spoken language in everyday life there. Most people speak the local language. But if you go into a bookstore, especially a more, you know, like a university bookstore, a more technical bookstore, you'll find that most of the literature there is actually still in Russian. Um, basically, popular books get translated into local languages, so most of, the books that get, most of the books that get translated into Estonian or Georgian or Armenian or languages like that are either novels or children's books. So you'll see a lot of novels and children's books that are, you know, in the local languages but if you get into any kind of more advanced books any kind of books about science university textbooks um, you know things like that which have a smaller market uh, those tend to exist only in Russian they have not been translated into local languages because there is not enough of a market for publishers to actually release those books in languages like Estonian or Georgian that may change with time. I don't know if that's going to change at some point in the future. I imagine that many of those countries are eager to kind of get away from Russian and have more books available in their local language, but the market being what it is, sort of the irony of, uh, of wanting to get away from communism, all these countries that wanted to get away from communism and go into a mar you know a free market system are now finding that the free market does not afford them enough uh, market share, enough market demand to actually have all these books in their local languages, which requires them to still have the books mostly in Russian. And again, that's that's a repeating pattern that I see in all these countries. Uh, even in Ukraine, to some, uh, it's in Ukraine it's a little bit less so, but even in Ukraine, you go into you know the big bookstores in Kiev or places like that. A lot of the books are still in Russian, so, uh, yeah, tends to be a repeating pattern. And yeah, the woman there spoke to me in Russian. I don't know what made her think that I spoke Russian. I guess probably, well, I guess obviously the fact that I was reading Russian language books, that I pulled out a Russian language book and started reading it, so I guess that gave her a pretty good clue that I had some grasp of Russian at least. And yeah, she just spoke to me in Russian, didn't assume that I spoke, you know, didn't speak to me in Moldovan or Romanian. And I spoke back to her in Russian, we had a you know, small conversation. And the store itself is quite delightful. It's, it's sort of one of these stores that has been dug out of some old buildings that used to be something else. Because when you first go in, there's like a, you know, there's like a small room of books. There's it's literally like a hallway. You're in a hallway of books with books on the sides. And you think, is that all? Like, it seems like you just, there's a hallway of books and you just go into a big empty room. But then if you go further and turn right from that big empty room, then suddenly there's another little room on the right full of books. And if you go through that room, then you get another couple of rooms. It's just like this chain of rooms that's been sort of reappropriated from some basements that probably were something else before. Who knows what they were before, but now it's been just made into this huge multi-Russian language bookstore. The vast majority of books there were in Russian. There was like one small section of books in Moldovan or Romanian. That was it. Most of the books there were in Russian. And you had everything from classic literature, like, like classic world literature, like, you know, British literature, French literature, things like that. Again, books about science, technical books. 
atlases, dictionaries, all those kinds of things. Most of them were in Russian. Vast, like more than 90% of the books were in Russian. So this is a very... It's, it's a mixed place. It's kind of funny how that works. It's like... This country has its own language. And out on the street, you see that language most of the time. But for any kind of specialized stuff, for any sort of... Uh, what Germans would call Fachliteratur, like, like books about specific subjects, like specific, especially academic subjects, those are still almost entirely in Russian here. So, funny kind of mixed bag. I'm very, interesting, I'm very interested to see what, uh, what happens tomorrow if I'll be able to get to Tiraspol, but I will, I will leave that for tomorrow. Again, just continuing with the language, I'm sorry, I know I talk a lot about the language, but I just find this fascinating. Um, if you look at these signs here, most of the signs here have, like these are, you know, directions to places in the city. Most of them have first the name in Moldovan or Romanian or whatever, and then it's in Russian, and then it's in English. Over here, something similar. But for the cemetery, for the central cemetery, and for the central train station, they have omitted Russian, and instead they have German. So instead of the Russian word Vaxal here, they have the German word Bahnhof for the train station. And for the cemetery, they have Zentralfriedhof, which is, again, a, a German word. So what does that tell you? When Germans travel, Germans want... I, I'm assuming they do that to cater to the audiences, like they, they do that to be appropriate to people who are looking for those locations. So I guess that means that Germans, when, when Germans travel, they go to the cemeteries and to the train station. Die Deutschen verstehen nur Bahnhof. So the Germans go to the train station and the cemetery. Russians want to go to the church and to the government buildings. I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious there. I'm guessing that that's because uh, the reason for that is just because government buildings are obviously something for locals. So I'm assuming the, the Russian translations are translations for people who live here and probably can speak some Russian. And the German translations... There's another ambulance coming up behind me. How many... How many ambulances are... Woo! It's a kitty! Wait. Wow. Uh, oh dear. I don't know if I want... Well... It's a little sad, but I'll, I'll go ahead and capture it on film. Oh, why is the camera blurring this out now? My cam camera doesn't want to focus. There we go. Camera doesn't want to focus for some reason. There's a ki on the right. There's a kitty who is obviously alive, but on the left that appears to be a not live. Yeah, that's definitely a. Oh dear, that's a. Well, that's sad. Somebody just left a dead uh, dead kitty just lying in the middle of the grass there. And the other cat doesn't even seem to be too much disturbed by it. The other cat's just kind of standing right next to it saying, yeah, there's a yeah, there's a dead cat there, no big deal. Um, what was I saying? Yes. So, stuff like the cemetery and the train station, obviously those are things that foreign people would look for, people who are not from here, people who don't live here. So I'm guessing that most of the foreign tourists who come here are probably German, and so they put those signs in German for the, you know, German-speaking tourists who come here, and then people who obviously want to go to some government office to get some bureaucracy done are probably people who live here, and so those signs are in Russian for people who live here. But that just bears out again the idea that uh, people here tend to speak Russian, maybe not necessarily as their main language, but again, at least as a language that they can speak, that they can use productively in uh, in everyday life situations. I guess since I'm here, I might as well get a few shots of some of these nice-looking buildings that are present here. I mean, they're, they're not really anything too special, in my opinion. I mean, if you've been to... If you've been to Paris or London or Moscow, you kind of... Uh, you, you've seen better, you've seen more impressive architecture. 
In fact, the, the Palace of Culture in Yashi was, I think, more impressive than anything I'm lucky to see here in uh, Chisinau. But since I'm here, I might as well... Might as well film it, because I don't know when or if I will ever again be in Chisinau. Um, someone's car is not starting there, as you might have heard. And yes, there are signs of spreading Western influence here, such as obviously this McDonald's here. Interesting that McDonald's didn't get cancelled here, or I guess that it didn't cancel itself, that it didn't move out of here as it did in, for example, Belarus, considering that this country is... Um, I wouldn't say involved necessarily, but at least somewhat Russian-aligned. But I guess McDonald's didn't feel the need to move out of here, so you can still get your Big Mac and your Whopper and your... No, Whopper is Burger King, sorry. I'm a vegetarian. I, I rarely eat in such places, so I actually don't even know what's the Big Mac and the Whopper. I mean, well, I know they're hamburgers, but yeah, Big Mac is McDonald's, Whopper is Burger King, and Kentucky Fried Chicken is, uh, I guess they don't have burgers, they have chicken. <laughs> you, you can tell how much I know about food, especially food with meat in it. Uh, anyway, I'm coming up on... <clears throat> what is probably the main central square of Chisinau, so I'm just kind of <clears throat> kind of giving an idea of what it's like to walk up to it in all its splendor. There's some big... Uh, that is a big building on the left there. That must be some government building. Romanian building... Roman, Romanian government buildings all tend to look the same. They all look like that. They're just these huge flat rectangular sort of things stately for how big they are but not necessarily very strong in terms of that of course was Russian rap playing over the loudspeaker there yeah so the, all these Romanian government buildings tend to look the same they're just these very big sort of flat rectangular prisms that uh are impressive for their size, but not for their architecture or design. And I realize that I'm not in Romania, but the same principle applies here. Somebody's rocking out here. Is this, uh... Oh! This guy's actually playing electric guitar. Wow, he's pretty good, too. I thought that was a recording, but I guess it's... I guess it's this guy playing live. Wow. He is... Uh, I don't think he's singing. Okay, he's playing over a recording, so... The, the, it is actually a recording, but he's playing guitar over the recording, which... Some people do. I find it a little bit lame, because... Most of the music is actually not coming from the performer, but... Uh, I don't know. From what I can tell, the guitar player seemed alright. Anyway, so yeah, this is... I don't even know what, what you... <laughs> I'm sorry, I always go into these places having absolutely no clue of what I'm doing or what I'm talking about. People have criticized me for that, saying, you know, you should do some research before you go to these places so you know what you're looking at, what you're talking about, and not just blindly and ignorantly stumble into stuff. But I tend... I, I prefer the spontaneity of the way I do things. I know that some people don't like it. I know that some people don't like saying, I don't know where I am, I don't know what this is. People would like a little bit more background information, but I, I do enjoy having these sort of spontaneous... Uh, serendipitous experiences. I think there is there is sort of magic and value in that. And that's also how Baldwin Bankrupt tends to do his videos. I mean, well, he does men he does some research. He does more research than I do. He, he does at least some research, but he often also has this experience of just kind of going to places and not knowing what he's doing or <laughs> basically being wholly unprepared for what he's gotten himself into, which is kind of what I did as well. But yeah, um, this is some central square, some very important central square, probably the most important central square in Chisinau. And I'm here. I'm present here, looking at this big tower with a cross on the top, and that pagoda there, also with a cross on the top, and this building here that will soon 
reveal itself from behind those trees, which might also have a cross on the top. It's probably a church. Yes, it does. It does have a cross on the top. I'm going to guess that's a church. Going to guess that is a church, because... Oh, I see. That's the church. That's the... Whatever, like a... Just like a little pagoda. And this is the magazine. This is the store. With the, t with the bell tower on top. Cool. I like this place. Actually, I actually really like the feel of the square. It's actually quite nice. Um, Chisinau has been... I think I read somewhere that it was voted Europe's ugliest capital. I don't know that I would agree with that. It's certainly not the most beautiful capital, but I think I've seen uglier places, honestly. I mean, this is, this is really not that bad. Okay, this is just one park. This is just like one square. You can't judge the whole city based on this, but it's, in my opinion, it's, it's not that bad. I think I've seen worse. Would I recommend that people come here? That's a tough one. I stand by my assessment that there's just really not, wow, that view here with the, with that archway. Like, if you look here through the archway and see the building behind, it's actually quite majestic. It looks pretty cool. I don't know. It's not difficult to come here. You don't need a visa to come here. Um, for most people, anyway. At least most for most Western countries. It's not expensive to get here. It's not expensive to be here. But just, you know, in terms of the time that you have for your vacation, is it worth investing vacation time and coming here? I don't know that it is. I don't know from what I've seen so far that I really, really recommend this place. I think that you can find more impressive stuff like this, it's more impressive stuff than this in other places. I mean, this church is nice, but, you know, the church in Belgrade, like that huge domed church in Belgrade, I forget the name of it, but, you know, if, if, if you know Belgrade, you know the one I mean, that huge, ridiculously huge domed church there is way more impressive than that. The markets are kind of cool, but who's going to come here just to see those street markets? Nobody. You can find similar street markets in other places. Everything that's here is like, you know, it's it's nice. It's not bad. I don't get a, a very bad vibe overall here. Like, it's, it's not bad. It's just, I mean, it just feels like another random sort of Eastern European city with nothing really to, to distinguish it. I just don't know that I could really recommend this place. I don't see anything to recommend it, honestly. So I guess I can understand why, why it is among the least visited capitals and among the least visited countries in Europe for tourists. Still, it's nice. I mean, I personally am glad I came here just because I'm a com completionist. I like being able to check those check boxes off on the checklist. But uh, if, you're, if you're not a perfectionist, if you're not, you know, if you don't have OCD like that, if you're not a collector of European countries as I somehow became unwittingly, I don't know, man. I think probably your vacation time and money is probably spent better in other places. That's just my opinion. But I'll still be here for a while, for a couple of days. Maybe I'll see something that'll change my mind. Don't know. The other nice square that exists here in Chisinau, which sits kind of, uh, I guess, kitty corner from the from the other place that I just was. Is that called kitty corner when the corners are touching? So it's like, not they're not like laterally next to each other, but they're diagonally next to each other. Like like the the two corners are diagonally across that street intersection there. I think, I think that's called Kitty Corner in English, right? At least Amer American English, it's like a American slang for that. Um, if so, then this park lies Kitty Corner from the other one. This is a more traditional nature park. See, the, other one, the other one was a more of a kind of a... Uh, what's the word? Landmark park? I don't, it's not really the... I don't know if there's a term, but it's, it's like a park of... Yeah, landmarks and things like that. This is more just a regular nature park with trees and benches and things like that where you can chill out and sit under the trees and think about Moldovian things and practice your Russian or whatever. I mean, it's a nice park, but it's pretty pretty standard as parks go. Looks like a pretty, pretty parky park, I guess. Pixel art. I love pixel art. I mean, I guess I would being a computer guy who plays, you know, old computer games. I love pixel art. So here's some pixel art of some beautiful flowers on a relatively quiet street right across the street from the uh, Museo Nacional de Historia, the uh, National Museum of History. Good morning, Chisinau. So here I am stalking the Wiley Marshutka. Um, 
trying to make my way through the market to where the the Gara Auto is. It's kind of funny these these places where people offer rides. They always have this sort of illicit feel to them. It's almost like it's almost like trying to find the the street corner where drugs are sold. You know, it's I mean it, it's not illegal. Like there's nothing illegal about offering rides to people or selling rides. Uh, but it's just because they're usually unofficial. You don't really like they're not typically marked on maps. You're just gonna have to know where they are. This one is official enough that it says you know like got an auto on it. Like it actually has the designation car station or whatever on it. But um, and in Yashi it was pretty easy to find. In Yashi it's just, it's literally just like right across the street from the main train station. So there's a train station. Yashi like there's a central train station there, and then you just cross the street from there and go into the little sort of courtyard there, and you'll find people offering rides to Kishino. In Tbilisi, in Georgia, it was hard. Um, in Tbilisi, there are actually several different places, uh, and I really couldn't tell you. I took a mashutka from Russia to Tbilisi, and I really couldn't tell you where the bus station was that the guy dropped me off. It was just some place where you're just going to have to know where it is. And... Um, And when I went from there, to, when I went from Tbilisi to Yerevan in Armenia, there was another place. And I asked several people, "Where's the? You know, where can I get a mashutka to to Yerevan?" And because people there don't speak English, I spoke to them in Russian, and people kept saying "Ortajal." And I don't speak Russian very well, so I thought, "Oh, what is Ortajal? Is that some?" I thought it was a Russian word or phrase that I didn't recognize. But after the first couple of times, I realized, oh, I don't think they're saying a Russian word. That must be the name of a place. And it turned out it's right. Ortozhal is a, um, <clears throat> it's like a district of Tbilisi. And that's where people offer rides to Yerevan. And even once you know that, even once you're in Ortozhal, which took me a while to find and get there, even then, you're just going to have to know where the guys are that are offering rides to where the people are that are offering rides to Yerevan. Like, there's no sign or anything. You just kind of have to ask around, and people will know. Like, if you if you ask, if you you ask walk around and ask a few random people, people will know. They'll just say, oh, yeah, it's over there. But you have to speak a language that they can speak, and most people here don't speak English. So, obviously, if you're in Georgia, ideally you'd speak Georgian, but if you don't, the next best choice is probably Russian. Progress here is very slow because there are a lot of people here buying things, all kinds of stuff on sale here. And you see people are buying lots of stuff and walking very, very slowly, which impedes walking down the street here. But I'll, I'm in no hurry. I'm on vacation. And the trip from here to to um, Tiraspol is only about one hour, or should be about one hour. So I've, I've got time. It's still morning, so I've got time to get there. The trip from Yashi to here was about three hours. Yeah, about a three-hour car trip. The border crossing didn't last long. So, yeah. Three-hour car trip from Yashi to here. So, let's see how it goes. And a couple of hours later, here I am in Tiraspol. So, yeah, I did not have any problems getting in. The person who told me that I might have problems getting in was clearly wrong. Um, at the border, there were no serious problems. Uh, they asked me how long I was going to be here. They said, are you going to be here just like one day, two days? I said, I'm leaving tomorrow, and they said, we'll need your address. And I'm planning to stay at the Hotel Russia. There's, like, one of the premier hotels here in Tiraspol is just called Hotel Russia. And I didn't have the address off the top of my head, but I said I was going to stay there, and that's, the, you know, they said, that's okay, that's enough. But the one problem, the one thing that does irk me a bit is uh, they gave me a little slip of paper stating... Uh, uh, interestingly enough, stating not my time of entry, as one might expect, but my time of exit. And the exit time that uh, is shown there is around midnight or five minutes before midnight today. Even though I explicitly said that I'm leaving tomorrow. I have a feeling, I have, a, I have a, an ugly feeling now, that tomorrow when I leave here and go back to Chisinau that somebody is probably going to shake me down for a bribe because they're going to say you overstayed your uh, your time here. Your slip of paper says that you entered. Or you're, not that you entered, again. They gave me a slip of paper that says not when I entered, but when I'm supposed to leave. 
and it isn't supposed to leave later today, latest midnight tonight. Uh, and that is not the case. I'm going to sleep here overnight at the Hotel of Russia, or that's the plan anyway. I'm going to leave tomorrow, so this is Yekaterina the second. So, yeah, like I said, I have a, a feeling that even though I explicitly said I'm leaving tomorrow and they stamped or they printed today's date on the the uh, slip, I have a feeling that's a setup for a bribe. That kind of thing happens here, apparently. I, I read about that being fairly common, that they'll they'll say stuff like that to people who, you know, especially tourists that don't know what's, what's going on. Um... If that happens, I'll, I'll argue about it. I'll explain that I, you know, there must be mis some, some misunderstanding. I explicitly said that I'm leaving tomorrow, not today, and it's not my fault that somebody just put the wrong date on the entry slip or exit slip, whatever. And they're not going to, I'm sure they're not going to ask for some huge amount of money, and it's not some ridiculous, not something exorbitant, probably just some small amount, probably just like enough to you know, what it would cost to buy, like, lunch or something. The guy's going to probably want me to pay for his lunch. Um, but, you know, it's just the principle of the thing. Like, I'm, I'm going to fight it. If, if they ask me for a bribe, I'm going to fight it and say that, you know, it's, it's not my... F I came in yesterday. It's not my problem that the guy put the wrong date on the paper, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I'm not going to worry about it too much right now. Let's uh, enjoy the time that I have here, because it's actually, you know, it's, it's a pretty nice place. I mean, it's... I don't know how I, can, how I can describe the vibe here. It feels very much like, you know, one of those places that... I mean, it's kind of what you'd expect. It's a place that's very much trying to fight against the uh, foreign influence that's creeping in. It's very patriotic. Very pro-Russian. I mean, driving down that, that street, as we were coming in on that street there, we saw Russian flags next to the Transnistrian flag. So, so Transnistria is very patriotic about their own territory, but they're also very Russian patriotic. They see themselves as allied with Russia, which is, you know, not not good or bad, just it is what it is. Um, so yeah. So other than that, no problems going to the border, no, no complications, it wasn't any big deal. Um, nobody asked me any other questions other than how long are you gonna be here and where are you gonna stay here? So, let's see. Center Klimat. I don't know what's the center, center of the climate. Climate center on that bird feeder. I don't know. Anyway, this is a pretty nice park, but I guess... Uh, I guess I will go into the city and see what I can find there. Since, uh, yeah, since I'm only here for one day, might as well make the most of that day. I think Tiraspol is not a... Like Chisinau, it's not necessarily a very touristy city, not necessarily a lot to see here as a tourist, but, uh, you know, again, since I'm here, might as well see what I can find. It's going to be a hot day. It's about noon, or I think around 1, one in the afternoon here, uh, and it's already fairly warm. It's probably going to get even warmer, but uh, we'll see how it goes. This is something I find slightly amusing. The store is called Haitiek. So Russian does a lot of this. This is um, this is basically the the local equivalent of, you know, like Best Buy in the USA or Saturn in Germany or stuff like that. Basically, or Media Market is maybe a, a better known international brand. But yeah, high tech, obviously a place that sells high tech stuff. Russian does a lot of loan words like that. They just sort of transliterate words, but they don't actually really properly coin a new word for things. So I'm walking down this street. This is the, I guess, the main street that runs through the center of Tiraspol, the main drag. It is called the 25th of October Street, which I'm sure refers to some revolution or other that I'm not familiar with. And you can see those flags hanging over the street there. To the left, that's the that yellow, uh, yellow, that red and green thing. That's the Transnistrian flag. And then also there's the Russian flag there. See that a lot on this street. Most things here are in Russian. I do I do see the occasional sign in the Moldovian language, but I think actually you're more likely to see English here than Moldovian. Or maybe not, actually, I'm not sure. It's kind of a mix of both. But most stuff here is in in Russian. Um I 
tend to focus a lot on books when I travel. I don't... I know it's kind of... I, I probably overdo it. Whenever I travel around, I always want to look for the bookstores and libraries, which is weird because I don't even read that much. I don't... Like, I, I really don't... I don't read a lot of books anymore. I don't know why. I mean, I have... Well, I guess there are several reasons why. I'm not going to get into it now, but... But, um... I still am very focused on books, and I always love it when I see a lot of books in a place, whether it's a lot of bookstores or a lot of, uh, even just those public bookshelves, you know, sometimes you see, like, open bookshelves where, and, like, you know, like in the middle of a square where anybody can just come and take a book or leave a book. I like seeing that kind of thing, even though I don't read anymore. It's kind of like, I guess it's how an impotent watches, an impotent person watches porn, you know, it's like, I like to see other people doing what I cannot do anymore. I mention this because uh, one of the preeminent bookstores here in Tiraspol, apparently, is the one I'm just coming up to. Namely, Dom Knigi, the House of Books which is the same name as uh, a lot of bookstores in Russia. Uh, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to go ahead and head in there and take a look at what it's like in there because uh, I'm assuming there are books inside. So I'll take a quick look and give my assessment afterwards. Okay, I took a look inside Dom Knigi here on the... Uh, here on the... Oh, they even have the street name in English. It's interesting. <laughs> they, they have the... Uh, actually, that's weird. Why is it... Okay, so on the top it actually says Borkovskaya Street, but then it says 25th of October Street. I don't understand why. Um, it's kind of odd. Because the three have two names. Anyway. Um... I'm a bit disappointed. It's a kind of a typical bookstore uh, in poor Eastern European countries in the sense that it's mostly children's books. Like, half the books are children's books. I don't know why this is. It's like, you know, when uh, people encourage their children to read, but when they're adults, they stop reading books. He said, hypocritically, knowing that he felt... I mean, I, I'm, I'm the same. Like, I also stopped reading books. So I guess I guess I can't really criticize. Actually, I can, but not without being a hypocrite. But... Um, want. There's a, there's a car that stopped behind me, and I'm not sure if he's waiting for me, but he's just stopped. Uh, so I'm just going to go. Um, so yeah, half of the store is children's books, and most of the rest of the books are used. Like, they're not really selling new books that much. It's, it's like a lot of really old books, which are very obviously quite used and old, uh, which is not bad in itself. I actually like places that sell old books like that, but it's nice if there are some new books as well. And in the back, there was like a, a shelf of classic literature, you know, like, like all the great classic books, which you see often in Russian bookstores, but nothing really, uh, nothing that really stands out. So most of, like, half of the bookstore was basically children's books, and half of it was old, second-hand books. And not much besides that. So a little bit disappointing. Uh, I don't think the books are going to get much better than that here in Tiraspol, but, uh, oh well, that's life. Let's see what else we can find here. Uh, this, yeah not really much to say about this place. It's obviously a little park next to a little housing area. Not Nothing very fancy. I'm going to go look for something else to, to film. Okay, so here's what I'm probably going to do. Uh, that Hotel Russia, which I'm planning to stay at, uh, that's on the eastern side of the city, like on, at, on the east side of the city center. So I've come back to this park. This is, you can't really tell from here, but this is uh, that park that I started at, where, where you saw that guy on the horseback, the statue of the horseback rider, which is find this building here. I don't know what this is here. This is some, like, little, uh, it's like a little mock-up of a mini village or something. Uh, so I guess it's, I don't know if this is, if this meant to be, like, some, uh, historical representation of Tiraspol, or is this just, like, a generic city with a church in the middle of it and some cannons at the periphery ready to fire into the the river there. Nice church there. I like the I mean it's a pretty typical Russian church, but it's still a pretty pretty nice looking church there. Um so yeah. I don't know that Tiraspol uh not Tiraspol but um Transnistria as a 
country, country in quotation marks, whether Transnistria really has much of a, an identity of its own. It kind of seems like it exists as a Uh, as an appendix, if you will, of Russia, which is, you know, not bad. Again, it's just interesting. It's kind of unusual. Um, I don't know how much longer it will be able to maintain this because um, there is effort. There are efforts underway to br <clears throat> excuse me to bring Moldova into the European Union in fact on the road here on the road from uh, Chisinau to here I saw several signs on the side of the road saying um, Moldova Europe 2030 with the European Union flag on it which I understood to mean that they hope to have Moldova as a member of the European Union by the year 2030 which is six years from now, as I'm speaking, which may be an ambitious plan. Um, I don't know where they are with that. I'm not, I haven't, like, I'm not up to date with the status of those negotiations, but it takes a long time. It takes at, at least 10 years for a country to join the European Union. In many cases, it took 20 years or even longer. So, um... Unless they're already fairly a fairly good way along with uh, with their negotiations with the European Union, then I think 2030 is a bit of an ambitious date. It's not the kind of process that has a fixed time length or a fixed end date. It, it sometimes takes forever because, you know, there's a lot of negotiation that happens. There's a lot of bureaucracy that has to happen. It's not a, it's not a set process, really. Every country is unique. Every country has their own unique individual case, and uh, the feeling, at least my personal feeling, is that this place is a long ways away from being a member of the European Union, but you never know. That could change. And I think that if the European Union continues to expand as it is, uh, it may end up falling apart under its own weight, kind of like, kind of like the Soviet Union did. Pobeda, victory. Because, uh, you know, what, I, what I've generally seen, and I think most people would agree with me, we're not really in an age today where, uh, where countries are taken by force anymore. I, I really say there are, there are exceptions. I say, I say as there are mul multiple territorial wars happening around the world now, but generally speaking, when countries fall today, if countries cease to exist, it's not a result of external forces, but more a matter of internal forces. When the Soviet Union fell apart, it was not because of external countries, you know, Western countries trying to destroy it. I mean, that happened. There, there were such efforts from Western countries, but the Soviet Union basically fell apart in the end because of internal pressures and tensions that kind of led to a lack of a desire to maintain the status quo as it was in the Soviet Union back then. So we're seeing the same thing happening now in, um, well, in a very dramatic way in the, in the United States. The USA is, I think, um, not if if it fails in any way, if it falls apart, I think ultimately it will not fail because of other countries putting pressure on it, but simply because of its own internal problems. And we're seeing that happening already. We're seeing the USA really fall apart in a big way because of internal pressures, because of economic divides and other sort of social class divides, racial divisions, ideological divisions, political, social, and cultural. I mean, I'm not going to get into it now, but... I'm pretty sure that when the USA falls apart, and I do say when, not if, uh, it's going to be its own fault. It's going to be because of what it allowed to happen within its own borders. So, and the same is true of a lot of these other Western alliances like NATO, the European Union, 
etc. And I'm not anti-Western, like, don't get me wrong, I, I don't really have a very strong ideological bias here. I'm not saying that, you know, I, I know people might, people might look at me here in Tiraspol, in Transnistria, talking this way and say, well, he's obviously a shill for Russia, he's obviously some kind of anti-Western. I'm not anti-Western, I'm not, I, I don't hate the West, I don't hate America, I don't hate Europe or the European Union. I just think that they've overextended themselves. They have extended their reach far beyond what they really should have been. The European Union has become much, much more than what it should have been when it was originally created, and I think that the problems associated with taking in too many members that didn't really belong in the European Union will probably lead to internal strife and divisions within the European Union. I mean, we saw that with Brexit already. I mean, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, was the first very dramatic example of that, and I think there will be further examples of that in the future. Same with NATO. Um, I mean, we saw pressures with Turkey. I mean, Turkey is in NATO, but it is not really Western-aligned, and so Turkey being in NATO is actually a very significant... Uh, it's not really a win for NATO. It's not actually good for NATO to have Turkey in it. It actually creates problems for it, so... Again, all these organizations like NATO, the European Union, as they gobble up more countries, I think they're going to extend themselves. They're going to overextend themselves and end up with internal problems that will tear them apart because they uh, became too, they just became too big. They tried to absorb entities that didn't really belong within them. So, sorry, and I went off on a bit of a rant there, but my point is just that. Uh, what was my point? Oh, <laughs> um, Transnistria as a country is only recognized as a country, as an independent country, by two other countries in the world. Those are their flags. The one on the left is Abkhazia, the one on the right is South Ossetia. I, I actually don't know how to pronounce that. South Ossetia, something like that. Um, there are reasons for that. Which I'm not gonna stipulate here. I think people can intuitively understand the reasons. I mean, I'm saying this, I'm not trying to be a propagandist here, honestly. Nobody's paying me to say any of this, nobody's told me to say this. I'm just commenting on the situation. It's. I do find it almost funny, like I actually laughed a little bit because it's. It's just, it's kind of funny. The, the way these games are played, the way this childish territorial sort of squabble happens. It's, uh, some people say it's horrible, some people say it's disgusting how, um, I don't know. I just think it's funny. I just laugh. I think the whole thing is pretty amusing more than anything else. But what was my point? Yes, I was talking about Moldova coming into the European Union. Uh, this is not a place I think that really should be. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to any Moldovians watching this who want their country to join the European Union. I don't think this is a place that should join the European Union. Uh, and yet, I know that nobody asked for my opinion, and even if they did, it wouldn't change anything. So, probably uh, that will happen eventually. And it won't mean that much. I mean... Russia tried to prevent some Balkan countries, like, I think, Montenegro, from joining NATO, and it happened anyway, so, you know, it's... Stuff's gonna happen, stuff happens, but even, again, even if these countries join NATO or the European Union, that doesn't mean that they're gonna get along there, and, in fact, it may actually... It may be good for Russia in the end, because it may lead to internal divisions that cause those organizations to get, you know, to weaken internally. So, actually, that might be good for Russia in the long term. Who knows? What is this? Ch Chudograd? Okay. Some kind of children's uh, playground or something. Uh, okay. All right. I mean, it's a pretty nice little park here. Um, not that much to it, but uh, it's interesting to walk around and see. Here is. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen with this place. Long, I mean, nobody knows. I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen to Moldova or Transnistria in the next 10 years or 20 years or longer than that. Um, the whole situation here is a little bit. It's a little bit unstable, um, especially 
considering that I am about, well, I think less than 10 kilometers, something like five kilometers, around five miles from the border with uh, Ukraine, which is significant, especially now. Actually, a lot of the people, a lot of the people in the Marshutka on the way here from Kishinev, a lot of the people I saw had Ukraini Ukrainian passports. I don't know why Ukrainians are coming here. I can guess, but anyway. But yeah, I'm, I'm just, like I said, I'm a little bit nervous about being here, more so than being in Russia, because Russia, see, the thing is, Russia is subject to a lot of international scrutiny. Um, that's why, you know, the very first time I was in Russia, I was a little nervous because I, I didn't know what to expect. But now that I've been there a couple of times, I, I'm kind of used to it. And I realize it is in Russia's best interests to fight corruption. That's why you don't really, you don't really need to be scared when crossing the border into Russia or out of it because... Russian border guards are punished for corruption. Cases of corruption are actually identifiably, uh, I, I, identitively, they're actively identified, like they're actively sought out and identified. And if it's found that a Russian border guard has tried to shake somebody down for a bribe, that border guard will probably lose more money in fines than they would have gained through the bribe. So people know that now in Russia. And Russia has done a lot to fight corruption. That's not necessarily the case in a place like this. I mean, how many people in the world even have heard of Moldova or, or Transnistria or know where they are? Not many people. And not many people care, even if they know where they are. Not many, not many people care what happens here. So a place like this can get away with corruption because nobody's really scrutinizing it. Nobody's really shining light on it. Which is, again, why I'm a little bit nervous about what's going to happen tomorrow because, I, like I said, I have a feeling they're going to try to shake me down for a bribe. And I'm going to try to fight it, but we'll see what happens. But um, that wouldn't really happen in Russia. I mean, I'm not saying it can't happen in Russia, but it, it's pretty unlikely to happen in Russia these days because Russia is aware that, that that was a problem. And they have done a lot to try to fight it. They have actively done a lot to try to punish people who engage in corruption activities like that in Russia. So, um, so yeah, I've never had a problem crossing the border in Russia. Didn't have a problem crossing the border into here. I, like I said, I anticipate I may have a problem crossing out, out of Transnistria tomorrow. But we'll see what happens. In the meantime, I'm enjoying the statue of uh, who is this guy? I didn't even, I didn't even note who the guy was. I think his name was on the base of the statue. But even if I'd seen it, uh, is it Suvorov? I think it might be Suvorov. I don't even know who Suvorov was. He was. Um, I'm bad at history. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm very ignorant when it comes to history and things like that. So I really don't know. Um, I'm gonna look it up. But anyway. Here I am, just chilling out on a pretty hot day. It's very windy. You can probably hear the wind blowing against the microphone. It's a very windy day, which is good, actually, because, um, because, um, it's hot. And that makes the day more comfortable. It would be, it would be really uncomfortable here if it was hot and the, the air was still. So the, the wind actually makes it nice. It's actually quite a... It's kind of an essay. Even though it's hot and even though I am sweating, the wind makes it more bearable. So I'm enjoying my time here. Not a bad place here. So I'm continuing to walk westward here. There's some uh, structures and things to see here. On the right, we have... Uh, <laughs> that is a... Boy, that is a uh, big statue of Lenin... As, I mean, he almost looks like an angel. Almost looks like an angel with those. Uh, is, is he wearing a cape, or are those supposed to be angel wings? I don't know. What is this building here? My goodness, it has the Transnistrian and the Russian flags on top of it. Obviously, some kind of government building. If I continue walking in this direction, westward, westbound, uh, not too far from here, maybe about between five and 10 kilometers in that direction is another city called Bender, Bender, which I don't think is named after the robot from Futurama, nor is it named after the act of going on a drunken rampage. I don't know the origin of the name, but it's kind of the border town. That's kind of the first city that you enter right after you cross the border into Transnistria. Uh, so this is, what is this? Uh, gosh, I'm not sure. I can't really, uh, 
I'm torn between trying to get a closer look and thinking it might, might be better not to. Um, I mean, you never know. You never know. People will start asking, who are you? What are you doing here? And if I say I'm a tourist, I don't know, they, who knows? I doubt that I would get into any trouble, but I'll uh, keep a respectful distance from the centers of power like that. Uh, I am not sure that there's much more to see here, honestly. Like, this is, I think this is about the western extent of interesting things to see in, uh, in Tiraspol. That's the park where I was by the river there. Oh, hey. Tanks, you are welcome. Every time, every time I have to do it, it just never gets old. Uh, so yeah, and I've, I've mostly been on this one street, but there's just really not much else to see. As soon as you deviate from this one main street, all you see is just random anonymous housing districts, which all look the same and look like anything you'd see in... Oh, there's some people doing some kind of exercise. I don't want to... I don't want to film that there's some kind of military exercise I think going on there. Is they're probably gonna, if I film it, they're probably going to get after me and make me delete the video, so I'm going to not film it. There are some young people there who look... They're, they're not even in uniform, but it, there's one guy in uniform who appears to be instructing them, so these are like some young cadets in training or something, I suppose. Um... Yeah. I think this is about the western extent of anything interesting to see here in Tiraspol. So I'm going to start going back and uh, maybe let's go to the hotel and that'll be it. Maybe that'll be the whole trip. Who knows? Okay, since I find myself with an abundance of time on my hands, by the way, I didn't see this the first time. You go into this park, this sign says Tiraspol, Tolka Luce, which means Tiraspol is simply better. I don't know whom they're trying to market to. Transnistria is such a small country. I don't think that... Uh, there's necessarily a lot of competition for where people want to live. I don't know that they need to attract new residents to Tiraspol with such slogans. But anyway, uh, so yeah, since I have an abundance of time, I'll come back here and um, see what I can find. So somewhere, oh, I see, I guess it's over there. There's a bridge over the river, which goes to like a little uh, peninsula or something on the other side, but I guess it's... Uh, I guess it is this bridge here. I don't know how well you can see it on the video, but it, yeah, there's like a white bridge back there. Okay, I guess that's where I would go. Okay, I'll walk over there and see what's uh, what's happening there. And here I am, crossing over a bridge without a care in the world. Sort of. Well, not exactly without a care in the world, but... Uh, the part about crossing the bridge was true. I didn't lie about that part, at least. Uh, unfortunately, there are not pedestrian walkways on this bridge. It's a bridge shared by cars and pedestrians, you can see, so you kind of have to watch for cars coming. And there are a fair number of them, as you can see. I mean, I guess... Technically, I guess the opposite is true. The cars need to watch for pedestrians. It's not really pedestrians' responsibility to watch for cars. Car drivers have to have to uh, watch out for pedestrians. I think pedestrians have the right of way here. I don't think that was the case in Iran. I was in Iran last year. I think that might have been the first place that I've ever been in my life where apparently pedestrians do not have the right of way. from how people drive. You can tell in Iran that, people, that pedestrians do not have the right of way by how people drive. Uh, there's a reason why pedestrians don't have the right of way. Anyway, crossing a bridge, crossing a canyon, sitting on the edge of top of canyon. Piece of time too small for me. Okay, enough of that. Um, I'll see how things are looking on the other side. So here on the other side of the bridge, um, I thought I might have to pay to get in. I thought this, this was a, like, a place you have to pay for entry, but no, this is a uh, dispatch center where you can order buses and marshrutkas to different places, so no, entry is free. Here there's a little mini-market, which is appropriately called Most, which means bridge, but you can see if you look inside, it's, it's abandoned, like the building's empty inside, so this place has been, uh, looks like it has been 
empty for quite a while. Uh, so if I wanted some kind of refreshment, unfortunately this would no longer be the place to get it, but that's okay. I think I'm, I think I'm good for now. Even though it is a hot day, I think I can go without something to drink for a little while longer. Let's go for a stroll down here and see what's by the river. You can tell how interesting a place is by, by how desperate I've become to find interesting things to film there. Like, in more interesting cities, I probably wouldn't spend a lot of time just recording my journey to the river, but Tiraspol being what it is, it's not necessarily a lot of, uh, a lot of cool stuff to, to film here, so I'm just gonna, since I have time, I'm just gonna take a stroll along the river and, uh, to show you folks what it looks like because I think I'm otherwise mostly out of stuff to show here. Chisti Bereg Chista Respublica. Um Oh what is Bereg? I should know what Bereg is. Um it bas it's, it says clean Bereg, whatever uh Bereg is. Clean Bereg means a clean republic. Probably it's not river because river is Rieka. Um, I don't know. I don't know what Biryag is. It could be maybe the bank. Is it the? It might be the bank of a river, actually. But it could be the bank. But I think uh, I thought that was Nebarajnaya, but actually, I think Nebarajnaya is a street that runs along the bank, not necessarily not necessarily the bank itself. So probably it's the river bank. I'm gonna guess Biryag is the river bank. So oh, is this a nude beach? You know, I probably shouldn't be. I probably shouldn't be filming people there in their nearly nude states. Saw some people there wearing like skimpy bathing suits. Probably people don't want to be filmed in that state, so I'll, I'll avoid going there with the camera. Let's walk down here and see uh, see what's over here. Okay, I got past the area with the sunbathing people. I think uh, I think it's safe to film again. Is this oh hmm. I was going to say, is this meant to be a, a trash, like a, a garbage disposal place? It looks like a fire pit, like a place for building fires in, but uh, obviously people have been using it as a trash disposal receptacle in any case. Um, yeah, I think this is pretty much it. I think I'm, uh, I think I am running out of places to film here in Tiraspol, so I will probably go to that hotel soon and call it a trip. Where am I going to go, man? I don't mean here in Tiraspol, I mean, like, for my next trip, because this was literally, like, like the last country that I had any intentions of ever going to, and, you know, later this year, I'll need to take another vacation, because, you know, you have some set allotment of vacation per year, and I need to use it. Like, I can't just say, no, I'm not going to take vacations. It's actually illegal. It, it, it's actually illegal not to take vacations in Europe so you have to use your vacation allotment somehow I mean I could just stay home I could just take the time off work and stay home and not travel but it seems like kind of a waste it seems like if I'm going to take vacation I should probably travel somewhere use the opportunity but I don't know I really have nowhere left that I'd want to go unless I go to like really far-flung places like I mean it would be nice to go to Japan or China uh you know, other places like that, you know, farther off in, in Asia, like India, Korea, the Philippines, Indonesia. I mean, sure, all those are nice places. Sure, it would be nice to go there sometime, but I don't know that I necessarily have the money for that, first of all. A lot of people think that I have this really crazy sort of very wealthy lifestyle because I'm always posting travel videos. People think that I must be this very wealthy person who's living this crazy jet set lifestyle, always traveling to exotic places. It's really not like that at all. Because I live in Europe, I can travel within Europe very cheaply. Like, to get here, my flight to Yashi was not expensive. And then from there, taking a mashutka from Yashi to here, it, that, that cost, cost almost nothing. When I travel, I, I usually choose, like, the cheapest hotels I can find. Or I'll even go to, like, hostels where, you know, like, ten people are sleeping in a room. Because you can, you can get a hostel for, like, five or ten bucks a night. That is super cheap. So, you know, I don't travel expensively. You don't need a lot of money to travel within Europe the way I do. But going to farther, more exotic places like Asia, like East Asia or Africa or South America, it's it's all possible. Like I'm not saying it's impossible. I just I don't really feel 
I'm in a position to do the financial outlay for a lot of really crazy wild exotic trips like that. So within Europe, within the scope of Europe, uh, this is it. This is literally like the last country that I think I could go to that I haven't been to. Again, other than Andorra, which, like I said, I'm okay with. I'm okay with not going to Andorra. I'm okay with letting it be the one place I didn't go. Um, I'm thinking about walking down. Like, I could probably walk down this, but it's yeah, it's just eh. Because I'm holding the camera, and I, I would probably want to use my arms to steady myself. Don't want to do that. I'm holding a camera. It's fine. I'll walk along here for now. But um, oh man, where am I going to go for my next vacation? It's actually, it's, it's actually bothering me. And when Alexander saw the extent of his empire, he wept for there were no more lands to conquer. Not that I'm Alexander the Great, or even that my name is Alexander, but you know what I mean? I just, I've seen everything. I mean, okay, that's a stupid thing to say. I, have, I haven't seen everything, obviously I haven't seen everything, but... Uh, you know, I've even gone back and forth in like the most important countries like i didn't like in france i didn't just go to paris paris is the only city in france that i put on youtube but in france i've been to you know other places i went to marseille i went to nice i went to monaco which is technically not in france but it's almost like a french place i went to lyon toulouse bordeaux non rennes i think that's it I'm sure there are other places I could go, but I mean, come on. At some point, it's just like, how many how many French cities do you want to see? Italy, too. I went to like 10 different places in Italy. It's like, at some point, it's like, okay, it's, it's enough. Even places like Hungary and Poland and Czechia, I went to like every major city in, in all those places. Like, uh, uh, sorry. A bee flew into my face and I got a bit, uh, got a bit flustered. Um... So, you know, it's like you could say, if I've only been to Paris and there are other places in, in France to see, but I've seen them. If you've only been to Berlin, there are other places in Germany to see, but I've seen them. Same goes for most other countries with anything worth seeing outside of the capital city. Like, it's just, I feel like I've seen it all. And I know that's stupid to say. I mean, I'm sure there are things that I have not, of course there are places that I have not seen, but then the question becomes, is it worth paying to see them? Is it worth investing one's scarce vacation time and money in seeing those places i don't know man <sighs> i have a gps but sometimes you know even with a gps you feel more lost than ever i guess i shouldn't be ungrateful it kind of strikes me as a kind of a very selfish thing to complain about. Like, I've been to every place, there's no place left to see. Uh, which <laughs> I realize is a very selfish thing to complain about. Like, uh, I know there are people who will probably never see an experience as much as I have and would love to have been able to see and experience what I have. So, I really should be grateful for what I have and what I have had in my life. And I am. I mean, even though I don't, I don't always sound that way, I am grateful for the life that I've had. Kind of, I sometimes think about, you know that movie American Beauty? I sometimes think about the last words in that movie. You know, sometimes there are things that I could be angry about. There are definitely things that I could be upset about, but... Every now and then I have these moments where I'm just overcome. And I realize that I am lucky to live. In such a beautiful world. Oh yeah, and I did look up that word, bireg, which I didn't know. Uh, it does mean, I have a translator up on my phone, so yeah, it does mean like coastline or, uh, or shoreline. So yeah, a clean shoreline or coastline means a clean republic. 
I guess it's kind of like, uh, the, the river is kind of like the colon of the city. You know how people say that if you keep your colon clean, then your body will be clean? It's kind of the same way, like the, the river is sort of the, the large intestine of, of the city. What are these guys doing? These guys are uh, coming in on some uh, big river raft, which is obviously meant for carrying stuff, but they're not even carrying anything on it, so I'm not sure. Are these guys like smuggling cars or what? Who knows what they're doing? They probably don't want me to film them, so I'll stop. Okay, I get the idea. It's not They're not smuggling cars, they're just ferrying cars so people can drive onto that thing and walk onto it and presumably pay a nominal fee to get ferried across the river if for some reason you don't want to drive. Like, is there, is there not a street? It seems like there could be a street that, that goes there. Like, you wouldn't have to take a ferry to get there, but I guess if it's more convenient to take a, a thing like this, then okay. So, now covering the east side of town, uh, this appears to be, I believe this is the entrance to the Botanical Gardens of Tiraspol, but I think you do have to pay to get in here. I mean, the fence surrounding it suggests that it's not, like, you can't just walk into it. Yeah, it looks like there's a kiosk there. Yeah, casa, you have to pay to get in. Uh, I'm not gonna pay to get in here, but, uh, looks like a nice, uh, nice enough place, at least. Okay. And here I am going through a little park. This is a another park, except it's free to go into, not like the botanical gardens. Also on the east side of town. Ah, uh, it's been been kind of a long day. Actually, not not really. It just feels like it's been long because partly because I've been doing a lot of walking, also because it was very sunny, very hot today, and so you know, a little. Sort of a diet uh, Ferris wheel. Um, yeah, it was pretty hot today, and the heat has made me a bit tired, so I am gonna go to the hotel after this and see what's going on there. I'm just beginning to realize that I might have a problem there. Um, I might not be able to pay for the hotel. Uh, it was not possible to pay for the hotel in advance. And the fact that, that that option was not offered to me suggests that, just as in Russia, uh, foreign bank cards may be blocked here. If that is the case, um, I mean, I could try getting money from an ATM. I'm gonna guess that probably won't work either. And if that's the case, I'm debating whether I should actually stay here tonight as planned, or since there is still time, and since, uh, since I need to sleep somewhere tonight, uh, I might actually take a, uh, a bus back to Chisinau. That would also alleviate the problem with my, um, with that piece of paper they gave me at the border here, which shows that I'm supposed to leave today, that would circumvent that problem as well. So, I might end up doing that. Grigory Ivanovich Kotovsky. Giroi Grashtanskoy Voine. Oh, hero of the, uh, Citizens' War? I don't know. Anyway, uh, alright, I think... I think that's enough. I will, uh, head out to the hotel. Boy, I really got here just in time. See, the time is just uh, just before five o'clock. So, it's time for a total bald and bankrupt moment. So, these legends at the Hotel Russia got me all straightened out. So, yeah, I had two problems here. The first problem was, as I expected, my suspicion was correct, foreign bank cards are completely blocked here in Transnistria. You cannot use them anywhere for anything. So I wouldn't have been able to withdraw cash from an, from an ATM either, probably. But they accepted Russian rubles. The lady at the desk actually accepted the Russian cash that I still had for my Russian trip, which was nice. And she gave me the change back in Transnistrian rubles, which means I still had a little bit of pocket cash left over to buy something from a store. So that was nice. Um, 
That's the first problem squared away. And then the second problem with, with my migration card where it shows that I'm supposed to leave today, the woman noticed it and pointed it out to me. And I said, yeah, they made a mistake. I told them I was leaving tomorrow. And for some reason they put today's date instead. She did not seem surprised. I'm under the impression that this happens a lot. It's probably standard practice here in Transnistria. And she told me, yeah, when you go back, if you don't get this fixed, you can expect them to shake you down for about 20 bucks, the, the local equivalent of 20 US dollars. Which is what I figured. I figured it couldn't, I mean, it wouldn't be hundreds and hundreds or something. I mean, that would be, people would refuse. But people get intimidated and say, yeah, I'll pay 20 bucks to get out of here. So, but she said, uh, she gave me directions to the, um, to the local migration office. Like there's a local government office where you can get, get such things taken care of. So I went there with my receipt from the hotel, went there to the government office and told the guy, he didn't speak, he didn't speak English, but I spoke to him in Russian. Luckily, I could speak Russian. I explained to him the situation. I said, look, they put the wrong date on my card. I'm leaving tomorrow. I'm staying here at the Hotel Russia. Can I get a new card? And he said, no problem. I sat for 10 minutes, waited for 10 or 15 minutes. He came back with a card for me. The card is dated for not even tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow. So I could stay here for two days if I wanted, but I will be leaving tomorrow. But anyway, yeah, so Hotel Russia. These guys are legends. Hotel, Hotel Russia. These guys got me all fixed up. They told me exactly what I needed to do. So... Yeah, it would have been a bad situation if I hadn't come here. Otherwise, it would have picked, well, wouldn't have been the end of the world. I would have had to pay like 20 bucks going back over the border. But uh, yeah, and the woman didn't seem surprised at all. Like, the that's what kind of standard practice here. So good thing that I, I didn't have to pay anything at the government office. They gave me the card for free. They gave me a card for the day after, they gave, gave me an exit card for the day after tomorrow for free, which is great. That means uh, that's one less problem to worry about. So yeah, um, I guess that's it. I'll go inside and get some rest in the hotel and that'll be it today. Uh, and tomorrow we'll see about the uh, trip back to Chisinau. And what exactly does that get you? So what, what do you get in the Hotel Russia? Well, nothing too fancy. It's certainly not a not an especially luxurious room, but it's, you know, it's basic. You know, you have two basic beds, TV with some stuff and things there, a little folder with probably some information about the hotel. Uh, view out the window. Do we get a nice view? Uh, oh, there's oh, there's a pool down there. It's like a little swimming pool with a fountain. That's cute. Um, okay, that's nice. Air conditioner for when it gets hot, which it certainly does sometimes. Um, bathroom. Ooh, pretty basic workable bathroom. Toilet, sink. Yeah, okay. Usual things. Okay. Can definitely work with that. Costs about 45 bucks. Is it worth 45 bucks? I don't know. Might be a bit expensive for uh, Transnistria, but it's uh, it is what it is. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention. Um, why did I start off in the previous segment by saying uh, I got here just in time because it's five o'clock? That office, that government office that gave me the migration card closes at five. So if I had to come here a little later than that, I wouldn't have been able to get the card. Maybe I would have been able to get it tomorrow, but that would have been dicey because I'm probably going to leave early tomorrow. So good thing that I got it when I did. So if you come here to Transnistria, first of all, make sure you bring adequate cash. Everything's got to be in cash. Your card will not work here. And expect to have problems at the border getting out, not getting in, because getting out, they'll probably claim that you overstayed your, you know, your migration card thing, and they'll probably want 20 bucks from you as a bribe, unless you can get it fixed at the government office as I did. So there you go. Forewarned is forearmed. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm here in front of the uh, Tiraspol train station. The, the word on the left is Voxal, that's the Russian word. I find it kind of funny that the word on the on the left, Gara, they, they put the Romanian word or Moldovian word, but it's rendered in Cyrillic, so it's like it's the right language but the wrong script or alphabet. Um, anyway, yes, I'm going to try to take a, uh, a bus from here. Even though it's a train station, they have buses here as well going to Chisinau, and the people at the hotel advised me to try to take a marshutka bus from here rather than so the marshutka yesterday dropped me off in front of that um that big park with the guy on the horseback um and i could probably maybe find a marshutka from there back to kishina but they said it's probably better to find one here probably get better uh circumstances if you try to take a bus from here so i'll try it from here one well, of these benches have uh, have seen better days um so yeah, I guess this is it. I'll go back to Kishinev from here, and then from there I'm flying back home. So that's pretty much it. Um, I was going to try to go to Bender, that other city, which is not too far west from here, still in uh, Transnistria, but I think it's just like a smaller Tiraspol. There's probably not much there. Uh, I think at this point, probably my best bet is to just go back to Kishinev. 
Um, so, yeah, once again, would I recommend coming here? Would I recommend coming to, to these places that I've been on this trip? Honestly, not really. Um, Transnistria in particular, you have the annoyance here that everything has to be paid in cash, because foreign cards do, do not work here. You can't withdraw cash from an ATM, you can't pay with a card. You have to, you have to take cash with you and then exchange it here. Which, you know, is not the end of the world, but if you run out of cash, then it can be a problem. Fortunately, I brought enough cash on this trip and was able to exchange it, but that's not... You know, you could end up in a situation like I had in Russia where I suddenly found that, oh, I don't think I had enough cash with me to, to pay for everything I'd want to pay for on the trip, and I didn't, you know, couldn't use my bank card to withdraw more cash because of reasons. But yeah, and then that, that whole thing with the... Uh, with the, with the border times, like having to, uh, like getting a card that basically said I had to leave on the same day, even though I explicitly said that I'm leaving on the next day, just as a way so they could, you know, so that they could try to get 20 bucks off me as, as a fine, in quotation marks. Um, you know, stuff like that. It's annoying, but it's not necessarily a deal, but it's not necessarily deciding, um... And, you know, again, I got around it by going to the migration office and telling them my situation, and they gave me a card which is valid for a couple of days, which is nice. But they didn't speak English there. I had to speak in Russian to them. Obviously, in a place like this, you're... <clears throat> excuse me. Obviously, in a place like this, you're at a huge disadvantage if you can't speak Russian, because most people here only speak Russian, so, you know. And then Moldova, Moldova as, as a larger country, like not just speaking of Transnistria, but Moldova as a, as a larger country... You know, their cards work, like I could use my card to pay for things there, so that's, you know, a convenience. But again, what, you know, is there really a reason to go there? As a tourist, is there much reason to go there? I don't really think there is. So, um, you know, again, for someone like me, because I'm kind of a completionist, I've become sort of a collector at this point, I came here just so I could kind of check it off the checklist and say, yeah, I've been there, which is nice in a way, but... Would I recommend it to other people for any other reason? Not really. Because, um, you know, unless you're fabulously wealthy and retired or unemployed in such a way that you don't have to work, then you probably have a limited, limited amount of vacation time that you can use, and I think there are better places that you can spend that vacation time than here. And again, by here I'm not just talking about Transnistria, but Moldova as a somewhat larger country. <laughs> So yeah, um, I guess that's it for me. Uh, I am going to try to find a bus here going to Chisinau, and then from there I just go straight to the airport and fly back home. I guess uh, I'll check in. I'll, I'll make a short video at the airport just to summarize, just just as like a last farewell, and just in case, just in case anything happens at the border, I'll report it there. But I don't. I, I expect that probably things will go well because I have a card now that's valid until tomorrow. So hopefully things will be okay there. So yeah. Uh, was there anything else I wanted to say? I don't think there was. If you're going to come here to Tiraspol or Transnistria, probably the best thing to do is make a day trip of it. Since they'll probably give you a, a card that's that's only valid for return on the same day, probably the best thing to do is, if you're going to, because, you know, Tiraspol is small enough that you can see most of it in one day. So, you know, come here in the morning, make a day trip of it, go back on the same day. That way you can probably avoid having to pay a, a, a fine when you go back over the border because they probably gave you the wrong date on your card if you're going to come here. I mean, as as a novelty, as kind of like a place where, you know, which exists as some bizarre sort of Russian exclave, I guess it's it's something different. But once that novelty wears off, there's just really not a lot to see here, honestly. I mean, if you like Russian, go to Russia. Unless you, you have problems with visas. I mean, I guess the nice thing about coming here is you don't need a visa to come here, and they don't stamp your passport, so maybe for that reason it might... I guess that could be a reason to come here. If for whatever reason you want to be in a Russian-speaking area without getting a visa or without getting a stamp in your passport, this, I guess, could be a way to do that because, you know, I didn't need a visa to come here and they didn't stamp my passport when I came in. They gave me that card, but they didn't stamp my passport. So I guess that could be a reason to come here if for whatever reason you want, you want to be in a Russian-speaking, Russian-aligned place without having a mark of it in your passport or without having to get a visa. That could be a reason to come here, but I think it's a very edge case. I think for most people, that's not a, it's not going to be a reason to come here. Um, but yeah. Okay, I am off. Going to look for a bus to Chisinau and probably talk to you folks in one final video soon. 
Oh boy, I lucked out today. So, um, it turns out that the airport, the Chisinau airport, is actually on the way to the city. Like, if you're going from Tiraspol back to Chisinau, um, the airport is, is right around here. So I just asked the driver if he could stop at this bus stop here, and he did. And I can just, uh, I've just got a relatively short walk now to the airport. I just need to go under the, under the highway through this tunnel. And the reason why I wanted to film here is because there's all this nice artwork on the wall of this tunnel. On the other side, there's nothing. It's just a white wall. But on this side, there's all this nice artwork of flying stuff. There's like a Blue Angels, uh, what is that, an F-18, I think? Some kind of vintage World War II aircraft. A jetliner of some kind. A couple of really old, like, World War One era biplanes. A blimp, or a zeppelin. Hot air balloon. Cool, all this, uh, all this artwork appropriately depicting aircraft in the uh, vicinity of the airport. So yeah, I'm here uh, close to Chisinau Airport. I did not have any problems going over the border. Uh, they didn't say anything to me, so yeah, pretty cool. I guess uh, I guess that's it for me. I'm just going to go to the airport. It's a little bit in that direction. I've got a bit of a walk ahead of me, but it's not going to be too far. And then that'll be it. So, um, thanks for watching, everyone. Greetings from Chisinau. Hope that it was at least somewhat enjoyable. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I know I keep saying this at the end of every video, but I don't know if uh, I'll make any further videos after this, because honestly, I, I'm just out of places to travel to. We'll see. Anything's possible, but uh, in the meantime, thanks for watching, everyone. Take care, folks. I am signing off. Bye-bye for now.